Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade and Justice in for another program to share constructive information on racism, white supremacy, what it is, and how it works. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the broadcast. Uh, looking forward to constructive programming on the system of white terrorism. Uh, today's date, Sunday, September 11th, 2000. 11. Uh, hopefully everyone will keep in mind the greatest terrorist in the known universe, racist woman, racist man. Uh, before we get started, invest if you think the program is constructive, especially a reading lamp. That would be super helpful. I have one on my Amazon wish list. Uh, it's under Gusty Renegade Amazon uh, wish list. Super helpful if you think the broadcast is constructive. Uh, hopping right to work, uh, joining us for the 15th time. Always a pleasure to have him on the program, and uh, I cannot uh, overemphasize uh, his gratitude and being just super uh, generous with his time and sharing his views on racism, white supremacy. I think he's talked to a ton of, of black people and non-white people over the years uh, and helping all of us become a little less confused uh, about the problems we face under white supremacy. Uh, if you need a copy of the Word Guide or the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, uh, either of those fantastic uh, textbooks, uh, the link where you can get the order form the address is tiny.cc forward slash fuller in all caps. I'll say it one more time. Tiny.cc forward slash fuller. And fuller has to be in all caps. Tiny.cc forward slash Fuller in all caps. You can uh, print out the order form. You can get the word guide, the code book. You can get them together at a discount. Excellent counter-racist material. Uh, joining us live for the 15th time, uh, Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Uh, Mr. Fuller, are you with us? I'm here. Outstanding. Thank you again, sir. Uh, just always a pleasure to have you on the program, and I know tons of listeners uh, who've heard you on our visit have said it is super constructive. It has really helped uh, clear up some of their confusion. I um, want to hop right to it. Uh, we've been uh, having a lot of programs and having dialogue, and uh, the concept of racial showcasing uh, has come up. Uh, your term, it's in the code book. Uh, the term racial showcasing, uh, meaning when racists when they take a victim of racism, a non-white person, and they put them out in front, uh, give the appearance that this non-white person is in charge, uh, that this non-white person is quote unquote successful, racism is on the decline, we got non-white people who are uh, quote unquote running the show. And you, you know, say that we should all keep in mind the racists, they are the ones who are in charge. They can put non-white people in these positions or decide to fire them, uh, really keep the emphasis on racist man, racist woman, and what they are doing. Um, I wanted to get your view uh, because we've, I've heard many victims, uh, many non-white people say that uh, they think, you know, it would be constructive if non-white people, uh, if we held other black people, quote unquote, accountable, uh, meaning non-white people, if you're doing things, uh, if you are okay with being showcased and going along with the racist program to help them maintain their system of terrorism, uh, there should be consequences, perhaps. We should be looking to deal with other black people who do things to help out racist man, racist woman, uh, to hold you know, one another accountable in this counter-racist effort. And I wanted to get your views on that. Well, it depends on what people mean when they say accountable and whether or not they understand the system of white supremacy. 
and uh, on the BGQ, Victims Guarantee Qualification, any victim of racism can say this if they wish to, but once they say, hold them accountable, they should explain in detail what that means. Because no non-white person has anything to do with what the white supremacists do, choose to do, except what that non-white person chooses to do about the white supremacists who are causing it to happen. Whatever it is that's happening that shouldn't happen to non-white people. That's what white supremacy means. The white supremacists, racist man and racist woman, collectively, are to blame for anything that happens to non-white people anywhere on the planet that should not happen. So if you're talking to another non-white person about what should be done about it, it's logical that the person who is making this request should be in the forefront of doing it themselves. In other words, the non-white person who is being showcased, you might say, and any non-white person can be showcased, all non-white people are showcased to certain degrees. It's just a matter of degree. If you're under the system of white supremacy, you're being showcased in whatever particular uh, task that you are set to do by the white supremacists. Now, if the white supremacists don't have anything to do with what you do, then you're not being showcased. But I don't know of any non-white person on the planet who is not being told what to do and what not to do by the white supremacists. That's what white supremacy means. It means supreme over all non-white people, not some or not sometimes, but all non-white people all the time, everywhere, in all areas of activity, within the known universe. So I would go back to this term held accountable, a term that's used over and over and over again. Held accountable how, in what manner, for doing what? These questions have to be answered. Otherwise, just the term, a cliche term almost, held accountable, what does that mean? Accountable what do you do? It always comes down to what you do. You're going to hold them accountable. Hold. Hold them accountable. Hold them how? And hold them for doing what? That everybody else isn't doing too. In one way or another, if they're classified as non-white. One prisoner of war holding another prisoner of war accountable while both of them are in prison? Hold them accountable how for doing what? One prisoner is sent to uh, clean up the prison yard. Another prisoner is sent to clean up the cells. Another prisoner is sent to paint the warehouse. So which one of these prisoners are you going to hold accountable for doing what? Painting the warehouse? Cleaning up the yard? Cleaning out the cell? Because the person who is running the prison is assigning all of these positions. So is each one of the prisoners going to hold all the other prisoners accountable for being prisoners? These questions need to be answered before anybody makes a move, if you follow the logic. It's all a matter of logic. What is it you're really trying to accomplish? Is it just that somebody might be mad and just want to beat up on somebody because they don't know who to beat up? Or what? But if you're going to act in a counter-racist fashion, that's anyone at any time for any reason, get through the root of what you're acting against and what thought, speech, and action you're going to use to do it and make that very clear. Otherwise, there's confusion. That term, that term that keeps being used over and over again, hold accountable. 
What does that mean? To whom? When? Where? And what's the procedure? Bottom line, what's the procedure and based on what? If it means you're going to do harm to someone, who is that someone you're going to do harm to? And based on what? Because if you're just going to, yep, you know, I don't know what that means since I don't know what it means. If I'm going to do harm to all non-white people for cooperating with the white supremacists, which is what all non-white people do, then does that mean that the solution to the race problem, and this might be what people are talking about, I don't know, is to exterminate all non-white people so that then they will not be subject to white supremacy? That is a solution. If you just, if all non-white people will just drop dead, there would be no such thing as white supremacy because there would be no non-white people. And there would be no non-white people cooperating with the white supremacists. But any non-white person on this job, on, on this planet that has a job, even if they're in so-called business by themselves or with themselves, as they say, which there's no such thing as that. There's no non-white person on this planet who is has his or her own business because according to counter-racist logic in a system of white supremacy, all of the business of a non-white person is being run by the white supremacists. A non-white person may be told that he or she has a business. Told by whom? The white supremacists. They allow non-white people to have what they call their own business. I own that store. I own that factory. I own that warehouse. And nobody tells me what to do. Not true if you're non-white and on this planet. The white supremacists tell you that you can even have a warehouse. They could blow it off the map tomorrow. So don't ever think that you are outside of the rim of the white supremacist system. Not only that, most businesses have some kind of monetary system. The white supremacists determine what the value of the monetary system in that business is. End of that story. So pick any area of activity. If you're going to hold non-white people accountable for cooperating with the white supremacists in any capacity, then whatever that holding accountable means, it means all non-white people have to go before the firing squad. According to what? Logic. Context of white supremacy. Very important point, I think. Um, I thought just I've heard that a lot, non-white people talking about um, who's the biggest Uncle Tom and, and who, you know, what black person is helping out racist man and racist woman the most, uh, that all of us just by being victims are helping racists maintain their system of terrorism. And I actually, when I was listening, or many times that I've heard victims get involved in this, it sounds like your concept of racial shadow boxing. I think you, you switched it in the word guide. It's racial. Is it a shadow fighting? Shadow fighting, yes, okay. or shadow boxing. Uh, the word boxing is not always understood by people throughout the world, so sometimes I use the term shadow fighting and or shadow boxing and uh, hoping that people will be put it within the context of the sport of boxing uh, where a person who is practicing on fighting a real opponent will fight his or her shadow. Now, you can swing on a shadow all the time and pretend that the shadow 
is your real opponent. And you can wear yourself out doing that if you wish, because the shadow is just a shadow. In fact, it's your own shadow. So sometimes non-white people want to attack other non-white people thinking that that's helping to solve the race problem. It's not helping to do anything except just eliminate another non-white person. The white supremacists who run the world like a slave ship can always go below deck or go to an island and just pick up another black person to replace one that is worn out or killed or just gave up or just whatever, disappeared. They can make them faster than they can be broken by some other non-white person. Why? Because that's the system of white supremacy that has that power. So if some non-white person thinks that they're going to make progress by eliminating other non-white people or telling them, well, take them out of that position, the white supremacists can put any non-white person in any position that they want to put them in. That's what being a prison master means. You have a supply of prisoners. Otherwise, you couldn't be a prison master. A prison master has a supply of prisoners and they can take prisoner A and tell prisoner A to do this and do that and then when prisoner A dies or is even beaten up by other prisoners and taken out of that position the prison master will go and get the person who did the beating and say, okay, you will take the place of the person that you just beat up. Since you're so big and bad and you're going to straighten out my system, you can't straighten out my system without straightening me out. And you haven't shown any nerve to do that. It's easy to pick on another prisoner. You want to take on the master? Here I am. I am the prisoner master, including a master over you. Mister, so you think you're king of the cell block? I'm the king of all the cell blocks, and you're in my cell block. Wherever you go, in my prison, which is this entire planet. So try that on for size before you take on your next opponent. That's the voice of the white supremacists. So far, they have made that stick. No one has proven to be the baddest person in that prison other than the warden. And the warden is racist man, racist woman, white supremacists collectively. Context of white supremacy. Uh, just, I thought this was very important. Um, we discussed this, uh, this concept before and how easy it is for non-white people to get into conflict with one another. It's, it's no penalty and you don't get in trouble for it. It's easy. It's a lot easier if they're going after suspected racists. Um, one of the most critical points that you made, you said, if we're really going to be scientific about this, we're going to be serious about ending white supremacy immediately. If all of the black people that you know we think whomever they are all the black people that we think are doing the most to help out racist man and racist woman if they all drop dead immediately absolutely nothing would change with regards to the non-white people the victims of racism the system would still be rolling our lives would not be improved it would be super easy as you said for racists to go select another prisoner to take all of those folks place and continue doing what they're doing uh is that is that accurate mr fuller that's logical. If, uh, if people would think about a scene out of the movie Gone with the Wind, there are two black people, this is near somewhere near the beginning of the movie, working in the field. And one black person looked up at the sun to tell time. That's how they told time, by looking at the position of the sun. They didn't have watches or anything like that, or any modern timepieces. 
So one black person says, quitting time. And the other black person says, you're not the one supposed to say quitting time. I'm the one supposed to say quitting time. And then he said quitting time. But neither one of these black people, of these slaves on this plantation, could determine what quitting time really is. They could call it out. They could fight each other about who will say quitting time and who won't. But quitting time and beginning time and all other time was not to be decided by either one of them, but by the plantation master, by the slave master. He is the master of all time for everybody who is a slave. But all down through the history of black people under the system of white supremacy, black people have gotten a lot of sport, had a lot of fun, worked off a lot of anger, talking about which black person is the biggest Tom, a sport enjoyed by all. Agreed. Agreed. Activity that needs to be changed immediately. Um, I Also, this is just a pattern um, that I picked up just looking through the word guide at some of the terms that you have uh, in here when you uh, are talking about the eighth area of activity. Uh, one of the terms, uh, the greatest insult. Uh, another one that I've heard consistently, tragic arrangements. Uh, we also got gutter sex. Uh, we have sexually trashed and or sexually sewered. Uh, these are in the word guide, the uh, terms I just used. Uh, maximum racist aggression. Uh, that's in the code book. Um, and then this is uh, part of the explanation that you have uh, in the word guide. Uh, he likes black females. She likes black males. He likes white women. She likes white men. And when you get down to the note section uh, for this uh, particular or these phrases, you write that sexual intercourse and or sexual play between white persons and non-white persons during the existence of white supremacy is dominated and controlled by white supremacists and as such helps to make non-white people into sexual and political simpletons and misfits, extremely weak-minded and silly persons in regards to their understanding of white supremacy and its effects. And I just wanted to get your thoughts about the use, the terms that you selected. They seem to convey a great deal of intensity about the incorrectness of these acts. And I just wanted you to comment on that pattern on, on some of the terms that you chose to use to describe uh, the incorrect sexual activities that racists promote. It's because the strongest motivating force among people outside of just a simple survival, uh, the first one, greatest motivating force is the system of white supremacy period among the non-white people of the universe the second greatest motivating force among the non-white people of the known universe is sex so since the white supremacists dominate the sexual activity of the non-white people of this planet it is the white supremacists who determine which non-white people will be allowed to engage in sexual intercourse or sexual play with white persons because the white supremacists control all of the nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war because all non-white people are subject to the white supremacists in all of these areas of activity, including the most second most powerful motivating force, which is sexual activity. So therefore, under the system of white supremacy, even when non-white people think that they have a choice of what they can do sexually with white people, 
they think that they are making this choice. They are not really making the choice ultimately, the ultimate choice, and even the situational choice that they allow to make is determined by the white supremacists, just like in any prison system. I'll go back to the prison system again, because white supremacy is a prison system. The warden determines who's going to have sexual intercourse by setting up the situation where people can have it or not have it. If you're in solitary confinement, you're not going to have sexual intercourse with anyone. But if you're allowed to be in certain situations, work in certain situations, play in certain situations where you can have contact with another prisoner, then you can interact with that prisoner sexually if the warden of the prisoner of the prison has decided that this is a situation that's acceptable to him or her. And you think of the entire universe, the entire known universe, the entire planet that people are on, on this planet called Earth, the white supremacists dominate all of the affairs of the non-white people on this planet, so they dominate the affairs of the non-white people when it comes to sex, just like they do in all the other activities, the jobs, the politics, the religions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even when a black person, you might say, a non-white person, says that, well, I saw someone that I liked and I hooked up with them, to use a slang expression. And uh, so this person liked me and I liked them and we got together and we have sex and nobody tells us what to do. The white supremacists have already predetermined that they will allow you to do this, sir and ma'am, if you are non-white. They have said that in this particular place at this particular time, yes, you can, in limited numbers, and they control the numbers because that's a part of their sophisticated refinement of the system of white supremacy in order to do what? In order to give the illusion that white supremacy is going out of business. They determine what the numbers of non-white people are going to have sexual intercourse with white people on this planet. They determine the numbers and the limits of those numbers. Otherwise, there would be no such thing as white supremacy. If non-white people can just go around saying they're going to have sexual intercourse with whatever white person they want to have sexual intercourse with, any time, any place, under whatever circumstances, it just looks like they are making that decision. That decision's already been made before they even came close in those circumstances to a white person where they could have that quote-unquote liberty. And that was preordained by the white supremacists, even though it may not seem to be that way. Because you have to remember, the white supremacists are experts at magic. They are experts at illusion. They are experts at making something appear to be something that is not. Anybody who's ever been to a movie that's been produced by white supremacists or people associated with white supremacists knows how powerful illusions can be. So that's just another illusion when a non-white person thinks that they made a decision and then acted on that decision that had to do with sex with white persons during the existence of the system of white supremacy. Now, what effect does sexual activity between white and non-white have on the minds of non-white people? Because that's what it's aimed at. It's to embellish that illusion, to make them think that they are exercising some kind of power that they are really not exercising. Actually, the power is being exercised over them, and they are being weakened. Not given strength. Why? 
because of the system of white supremacy still being in place. If there were no white supremacy, it'd just be, it would just be male meets female and having sexual intercourse and engaging in sexual play, even Stephen. But under the system of white supremacy, which is a prison system, all of this activity is controlled by the warden in order to do what? To make the prison system stronger by giving the non-white prisoners the illusion that they're really not in a prison because they're having such a lot of fun. Sex is a lot of fun to a lot of people. So they have the illusion that at one time, that it, if at one time they did not have quote unquote sexual freedom with white people, then all of a sudden they have it. It's like in their minds being released from prison. But they're still in the prison. They're just being fooled by being allowed to do something that most likely previously they weren't allowed to do without being persecuted. That's why that particular act is the most devastating act on the minds of a non-white person. A non-white person who is having sexual intercourse with a white person in the system of white supremacy is becoming more and more weak-minded without them even knowing it. Now, they shouldn't be blamed for it. It's the white supremacists who should be blamed for that because it's just another form of misuse. The warden having sexual intercourse with the prisoner. That's equivalent to child abuse in the system of white supremacy. If there were no white supremacy, no problem. But you're not supposed to take further advantage of someone who is already in a weak position. Anybody that runs a nursery knows that. And black people on this planet are in a nursery. They are weak. We're all weak. I'm weak. If you're classified as non-white and you're on this planet, you're in a weak position. So the person who has put you in that position comes and has sexual intercourse with you. You have become weaker, not stronger. Why? Because it's not on an even field. That's why. Prisoner and warden. Dictator and the one being dictated to. It's not a level field. It's not equal. Therefore, it's unjust activity against the non-white person. Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., context of white supremacy. Uh, before I check with Justice to see if she has some questions, I wanted you, I just wanted to make sure I got in for listeners. Um, there's been a lot of this, what you term gutter sex, uh, all the way back since the beginning of white supremacy, and that has not ended this system. And I suspect as long as it exists, uh, racist man and racist woman will continue to uh, sexually sewer their victims. But one point I wanted to get in, you said that under the refinement of white supremacy, racists will present, you know, some so-called couples, black white person or non-white person with a white person uh, and presented as though this is a quality relationship. These folks are married, family, all of that. And you said that there are not even that many of these so-called, uh, put that in quotes, relationships. There are not even that many of these tragic arrangements. It just, it's a part of that illusion. If you see one or two uh, in your mind, you'll think, oh, wow, this, this must be an area where they're really progressive. They don't have any racism. There are a ton of uh, so-called, quote-unquote, interracial relationships when that's not true at all. Just because you saw one or two, your mind will, you know, inflate that to make you think that the whole town is filled with tragic arrangements, quote-unquote, interracial relationships. Um, could you share a thought on that? Absolutely. 
this is why I look at the schools. See, if this was true, if white people and non-white people were all in bed with each other having a good old time, as you might say, then it would reflect itself in every school everywhere. But when you go to most big cities in this area of the world, you see all black people in the schools. Now, this is a result of some sexual intercourse. Black people having sexual intercourse with each other and then being shuffled off to a, a side of town. Black people are assigned places under the system of white supremacy. Just look at that alone. That's just one example. Just the schools alone. You go into school after school in any so-called big city. You see non-white people and a sprinkling of white people maybe in most of the uh, most congested areas of any city or the city itself. Pockets of uh, white people here and pockets of white people there with a few black people and brown people, as they say, as they say, scattered in between. But you have large concentrations in an educational institution. Even in 2011, who are concentrated in what has been called for the last 50 or 60 years, inferior schools. But these people that you see are the results of sexual intercourse. If there's any people there who are classified as non-white who look like they're white, that's a result of sexual intercourse between a white person and a non-white person. But if that person looks like or has been registered as a non-white person, they are most likely going to wind up in a quote-unquote all non-white school, which means that somebody is playing some kind of game and that the sexual thing has not counted. It hasn't solved the problem. Many people have said down through the years, if enough black people and enough white people have sexual intercourse and produce uh, offspring, the, the race problem will be solved. As quiet as it's kept, there's a lot of black people who believe that. Well, uh, millions and millions and millions of black people all over this planet have had lots of sexual intercourse, tons of it, with white people for centuries. Not just in the last 20 or 30 years, but for centuries has not solved the race problem. That needs to be thought about. Now, there is an approach that can be made, and that approach is to point this out, what we're talking about right now, and then say, maybe we should go at it another way. Stop all of this. Save the fun for last. Save the sexual intercourse and sexual play for last. And take care of the first area of activity first. That's the business-like way to handle anything. Fun last. Serious business first, rather than making the fun the serious business. And serious business comes under economics, time and energy, the money. And in the second area of activity, education. If you can't get that education thing straight, everything else is going to fall apart anyway immediately. So the white and non-white have to get the same amount of education so that you have a lot of smart white people and tons of smart non-white people. And they all work together in harmony and in all the other areas of activity, constructive entertainment rather than this raggedy system of entertainment that white and non-white people engage in. The ones that come under the banner of tacky, trashy or terroristic when we entertain each other and when non-white people entertain themselves in the system of white supremacy. It's tacky, trashy, and terroristic. 
almost in any huge gathering, with some exceptions, of course, but on account of the system of racism, which is toxic, almost anything that non-white people engage in is toxic. All of the areas of activity, whether they are with uh, non-white people only or with white people, in the system of white supremacy, because the system of white supremacy itself is toxic and makes everything else toxic, makes everything else poisonous. So, getting back to the core of what we're talking about, the sexual activity should be saved for last, and the non-white people of this planet should say that, just say that. Millions of them won't pay any attention to it, just like they don't pay much attention to their religions either. Many non-white people cut corners on their own religion. So they they would cut corners on, you might say, the sexual activity. They would proclaim, oh, yeah, that's a fine idea, but they'd still be doing it. But even with that, it's correct to say that this is what should be done. Everything starts with at least saying what should be done, even though people will continue to do the thing that shouldn't be done. Still say, set it as a standard, this shouldn't be done, and say why. Because it only adds to the confusion, that's why. And it doesn't solve the problem. It does not solve the problem. There's no logical reason to believe that that alone will be a problem solver. You have to have everything in a certain order, logically speaking, and that is get the schools straightened out first. Get the housing straightened out first. Get the money straightened out first. And the use of time and energy generally under economics, use of time and energy. And you might say the religion. White people and non-white people can't even sit in the same churches, even after all these years, talking about how pious they are. But the houses of prostitution have more white people rubbing stomachs with non-white people than the churches have white people sitting next to non-white people talking about Love and justice and heaven. That's weird. And at the same time, on the same day, in the Northwestern Hemisphere, as Martin Luther King would say, on Sunday morning, the most so-called segregated hour ever is in the churches. But you can go right down the street to the motel and you'll find non-white people and white people trade in flesh in a motel, sexual intercourse, but they can't sit next to each other in a church. Now, I understand fully that sometimes the whole argument is why they can't do that is sometimes white people might say that they don't like to sing it. And sometimes where black people are concerned, particularly all the people that believe in gospel, singing the gospel, they don't like the style. So both people really are letting style get in the way of substance. Maybe they need to do away with the styles. How about that for a suggestion? Get rid of the organ in there. Get rid of the piano. Get rid of the choir. Oh, that's devastating to some people. Some people will tell you that's what they go to church for. You get rid of the choir, no church. Forget about the Bible. They want to hear the songs. Just things to think about. In alphabetical order, sex is right next to religion in the nine areas of activity. And war. Yes. Interesting. 
<laughs> Context of white supremacy. Uh, again, if you need the word guide or the code book, uh, the address tiny dot cc forward slash fuller in all caps. I'm going to justice right now, but address one more time. Tiny, T-I-N-Y, dot C-C, forward slash, fuller, in all caps. You can print out the order form, get the word guide, code book, very constructive material. Uh, Justice, if you have some questions for Mr. Fuller, your line should be open. Proceed. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, greetings, Mr. Fuller. I am uh, glad uh, to for you to be uh, back on the program. Uh, why do you want to be informed about the system of white supremacy? And do you enjoy studying and talking about racism, white supremacy? Uh, I didn't. I didn't quite get the question. Why do you want to be informed about the system of white supremacy? And do you enjoy studying and talking about racism, white supremacy? Not really. Uh, the second part of the question, no, I, I, uh, I don't enjoy it, but I think that it's necessary for people to think about it. And so therefore I talk about it so that people will think about it because like I put on the back of the book, uh, the basic code book, uh, no major problem can be solved without solving the problem of racism, which is white supremacy. People have problems every day, all day, all over the planet, either small problems or large problems or both. Most people have both, but you can't solve any major problem. And you have to solve major problems in order to solve the minor problem. So the major problem of the people of this planet is racism in the form of white supremacy. It gets in the way of everything. You try to solve the religious problem, the educational problem, the problem of sex. I mean, choosing sexual mates and all like that. You can't straighten it out in any way that will make sense as long as the system of white supremacy exists. Because any time anybody tries to engage in any of these areas the air, uh, of activity, that area of activity is riddled with flaws and loaded with poison. And there's just no way to make them work the way that they should work. Politics, the educational system, even entertainment, make it work in the most constructive manner in the system of white supremacy. It always has that non-constructive effect on non-white people. It might give a lot of white people power, but it has a non-constructive effect on the non-white people. It's not the best system. The best system, theoretically, would be a system of justice and correctness, meaning being in balance with people being in balance with each other, and with the general environment. That's what correctness means. Being in balance with the trees, being in balance with, uh, with the clouds, the rain, uh, and interacting with other people in a manner that will guarantee that, at least as best they can guarantee it. Meaning being able to sit down and say, well, if we're going to divert the water, in this direction, make sure that the water, when it gets out of our control, doesn't run down the hill where we have already put people whom we know will be underwater when the flood comes, i.e. Katrina, so that at least we'll all share the same burden and all be willing to share the same burden of putting up with things that we don't understand or can't control, like what we call nature and whatnot, the results of a tornado, rather than squabbling among ourselves about who's going to get what, based on color, 
based on color. And the whole planet has that kind of turmoil because the system of white supremacy produces that kind of turmoil. And even under what you call natural disasters, the color factor comes in where people start squabbling about who's going to get what based on color. Should not be. Should have never been. That should never be a factor. No more than who's tall and who's short and who weighs 160 pounds and who weighs 165 pounds. You're going to make a difference in the treatment of people as far as benefits based on that. Color is no difference, but the white supremacist says that's the best way to run the world. It's not logical. If you start thinking about justice. Hello? Okay. Uh, How do white people treat you now today? How did what now? How do white people treat you now today? Oh. Uh, the white supremacists, white people in general, and I, I'm only addressing only the white people who practice white supremacy because that's what my book's all about. That's what all my talk is all about. I'm not talking about all white people. I'm not talking about the white people who don't practice white supremacy. I'm talking about just the white people who practice white supremacy because they are the most powerful. I'm only addressing the most powerful people the smartest and most powerful people on this planet are the white people who have chosen to practice the system of white supremacy, which is mistreatment of people based on color. That's what white supremacy is, mistreatment. There would be no argument against a person doing anything that is of constructive value because that person is white. No person should object to that. That makes no sense at all. A person is engaged in constructive activity all the time, everywhere, with everybody, constructive activity, not trying to do harm, unjust harm to someone, and that person is white. No one should object to that. But everyone should object to a white supremacist going around looking for harm to do to non-white people based on those people being non-white. And that's what a white supremacist does. That's why all logical people, all people who think that they are, are at least have the correct intentions should be opposed to any white person who demonstrates directly or indirectly that he or she is in favor of the system of white supremacy, mistreating people based on color. And even if the white person is aware, and many of them are, most of them are, every white person is aware of the existence of racism, and they are not trying to end it and replace it with a racism with a with a system of justice. That person is a white supremacist, but you can't call them that because there's no way to prove it. So you do the best you can by calling them the next best thing in a compensatory way, and that is suspected racist, suspected white supremacist, suspected by whom? by the person doing the suspecting. And who should be suspected? Any white person who is not proven to that individual non-white person that he or she is not a racist. That's the only measure you can use. Why? Is that harsh to do that? No, because there is no master book that I know of, no guidebook, No almanac, no system that is set up that lists everyone who is a racist 
and everyone who's not. So since racism exists in the form of white supremacy, it means any person classified as white may be a white supremacist on one criteria. That criteria is if he or she is able to be one, then that person comes under the title of racist suspect. And that person should not object to that title because somebody's got to be suspected of being a racist in an entire system of racism. But a white person who is not a racist shouldn't have any problem with people's suspicions because he or she can always step forward and say, I'm not a racist and I will prove that I'm not a racist by everything that I do. You won't see me doing anything to support racism in any area of activity at any time ever. So I don't have to hide. I don't even have to explain myself. You will know me by my works. And I will oppose racism and oppose people who practice racism. You will know me by my works. And who will determine whether or not that person is telling This is a very deceptive. Each individual victim of racism will make that determination. Why? Because there's nobody else to make it with any credibility. That's the logic. That's the counter-racist logic. I was talking a little fast there, so a person, in order to digest that, might have to go over everything that I said very slowly. Review it back and forth, every word that I just said about this particular subject. And then C, make that determination, like anything that I say, really, to see if it is logical, constructively logical, out of all other things that can be said or done about any segment of the subject. Hello? Uh, hello, can I be heard? Hello? I think my... We can hear you. Okay, sorry, my... Okay. Um, what do you think uh, white people will do once President Obama is no longer president? What do I think white people will do when President Obama is no longer president? Yes. Is that the question? Yes, sir. Oh, well, they will do what white people do. Only white people know what they're going to do about anything. I can only guess until they tell me what they're going to do or don't tell me what they're going to do. But they will do what they're going to do. Now, as far as President Obama... He could not be president without white people saying that it was all right for him to have that title. But the decisions that are made that affect non-white people, either while President Obama is President Obama or after President Obama has been president, or before President Obama became president, the decisions that were made and that will be made in the immediate future will be made by the same people who made the decisions about non-white people before President Obama was president during the time that President Obama is president and after. That's the logic because we're in the system of white supremacy. So the system, the white supremacists 
In other words, white people who believe in racism will decide what will happen to people like myself. They were deciding that before President Obama became president. And all during the time that he's been president and after he is no longer president, President Obama does not make the decisions that will affect anything that has anything to do with me or any other non-white person other than himself. The bottom line decisions, the major decisions, the most important decisions are made by the white supremacists. That's what white supremacy means. Supreme. President Obama is not white. He's sometimes called half white, but there's no such thing as half white, according to logic. You're either white or you're not. Period. That term half-white is something that's made up by the white supremacists in order to do what? To confuse the victims of white supremacy, along with hundreds of other terms that they use. To do what? To confuse the victims of white supremacy. Because you can't dominate people over a long period of time without keeping them confused. They are experts at it. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Fuller. Um, I do have more questions, but um, I'm going to let the callers uh, uh, get some questions in. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Folks, if you have questions for Mr. Fuller, uh, any of the folks that are, if you dialed in on the talk shoe line, it would be star eight. If you dialed in on the free HD line, it would be star six. If you have questions, um, go ahead and go to the phone lines. If anybody would like to ask Mr. Fuller a question, <laughs> I'll try to codify. Um, we would uh, appreciate it uh, if you could just ask your question and not share anecdotes and or stories and what have you. Just stick to your question, please. And I, uh, again, want to give out the address. Hopefully, folks will get their copy of the Word Guide and or the code book. Uh, the address, again, tiny dot cc forward slash fuller in all caps tiny dot cc forward slash fuller in all caps uh non mighty wick uh you have a question for mr fuller your line should be open non mighty wick proceed hello can i be heard yes sir okay uh thanks for coming on mr fuller um I just wanted to know, uh, in your view, uh, the numbers uh, that white, the statistics and whatnot that white people or the white supremacists um, would uh, provide, um, you know, on their birth rates or, you know, death rates or just on themselves or on non-white people in general. How accurate do you think those numbers are? And uh, just how significant do you do you feel that that information is uh, for uh, coming up with strategy to replace white supremacy with with, with justice? Mm, that's a, that's a long question, and I kind of lost it. I, I didn't hear part of it, and then I lost the rest of it as far as meaning is concerned. Uh, can you can someone capsulize it for me? Yeah, uh, let me see. I, I'm just I'm uh, I'm wondering in in your view the statistics uh, that are provided, uh, how accurate do you think they are, and do you think that information and how significant do you think that information is in uh, strategizing uh, or coming up with strategy to eliminate white supremacy? Now, depending on what statistics we're talking about, are we talking about numbers? I don't think I understand the question. Like uh, how many white people are on the planet, you know, currently, how many, you know, in, in relation to how many non-white people are on the planet, uh, you know, how, how often are they born and so forth. Uh, 
the numbers of uh, how many, uh, you know, uh, white people are engaging with sex with non-white people as far as uh, marriages go, these numbers. Oh, I will say that I don't know. I want to go by what the white supremacists tell me or allow me to know. And they will, they are the ones who are the masters of statistics of anything that has to do with the non-white people of this planet, simply because they are the masters of non-white people in all areas of activity. So they are the ones who make these statistics. So whatever statistics they put out, I can either believe it or not believe it. But one thing that I can believe with assurance, and that is the system of white supremacy is still in place. Now, how many white people there are, people classified as white that are on the planet? I have no way of knowing that except to check with the white supremacists, and then I don't know if I can trust their statistics except to say that they are the ones who make that determination anyway. The white supremacists, by being supreme, decide who is white and who is not at any given moment. This is why they come up with terms like the one that I just used to describe what they say is President Obama. They say that he's half white. When logic tells me there's no such person as a half white person. You're either white or you're not. You can't be half white. They have other terms like even when they're talking about paint that doesn't make sense uh, off white. That's another term. How far off? Two miles? Twelve inches? Six a trillion uh, kilometers? Off white? Even when you're talking about paint, what do you mean off white? Off? Off white? What does that mean? It's either white or it's not. What do you mean off white? Off white? You know, off-white sounds like it might be if you have off-white, you got on-white. But it's one thing you do notice for sure. When you check any type of census in the Northwestern Hemisphere, white is listed at the top. If you're going to take any, any do things in alphabetical order, white would not be at the top. There's a reason why white is at the top. You'll say white, and then you'll say African-American, then you'll say Negro, then you'll say Chamorro, then you'll say Puerto Rican, which is really not a color. Chamorro, as far as I know, I don't even know what that is, but I don't think it's a color. When you talk about people, maybe when you're talking about something else, you might be talking about difference in color, purple or green or something like that. But people have a visual color that we that has been given names like black, Brown, you even hear people use expressions like black people and brown people in conflict with each other. Most black people are brown. So what are we talking about here? Just more of the racist tricks. Since we're talking about statistics, how do you keep statistics that are accurate when you're talking about brown people and black people when most black people are brown? And then you're using terms like off white maybe or half white or Indian blood Indian blood what's Indian blood and it goes on and on and on and you uh, relate all of this to color of skin in people How do you explain it in a way that makes sense? Every census that is put out based on what you call race, if you look at it and think logically, nothing about any of them make any sense at all except one thing will stand out, and that is the only thing that really will make sense is white. There's even a category called African American. But you have white people who say that they are born in Africa, and they came to this area of the world in what they call New York City, took out citizenship papers, and then proclaimed 
accurately, as far as the paperwork is concerned, that they are African American. And then someone who has never been to so-called Africa, who is black, will call him or herself an African American. But here you have a white person who says, I was born in Johannesburg in 1982, and I came here, and I settled in New Jersey, and I got my citizenship papers last week. I was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm a white man. My name is Kruger. And now I am an African American. I got my papers to prove it. You got your papers from whom? From people who issue papers that say that I am an African American. And nobody can prove that I'm not. And then that same white man, Mr. Kruger, who is now calling himself an African American, will turn to a black person and say, what part of Africa are you from? And the black person says, well, I've never been there. And he will say, I rest my case. Confusion. The white supremacists are masters of confusion. They're always way ahead of black people in their thinking which is why black people are subject to the white supremacists and the white supremacists or the white people who practice white supremacy are certainly not subject to the black people because you can't have black people making white people subject to them and have white supremacy in the same universe at the same time, which is another factor. Sometimes the white supremacists will say, well, we got some black supremacists out here who are making trouble. That's a false statement. You can't have white supremacy and black supremacy in the same universe at the same time. It is totally impossible. But even some black people will say, yes, we got some black people who believe in white supremacy. You can't believe in something that you're not doing. A black person can say that they believe in black supremacy in a system of white supremacy, but that's just like a prisoner saying to the warden, I'm not a prisoner. You're a prisoner, warden. Warden, you are the prisoner. Why? Because you're on the other side of the bars. You are my prisoner. I'm not yours. Sure. The prisoner can say that, but when it comes to mobility, he can't prove it. We can think about it within that context, along with all the other confusion out here that the white supremacists are expert at, including making statistics. Thank you. That's it. Um, person, thank you, Non Mighty Wick. Um, person who dialed in uh, on TalkShoe uh, with a hand up. If you had a question for Mr. Fuller, your line should be open. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, greetings. Um, I would like to um, ask if this thinking is correct um, about the terms uh, black, um, white, non-white people of color um in my opinion um i just want to know if this is correct from uh you know mr fuller's uh thinking uh opinion um i just want to know if this is correct i think in my opinion terms such as white black non-white and people of color are very superficial um it's not the terms are not explaining to me what what I'm talking about, the phenomenon is, like, for example, if I compare the color of white computer paper to the skin color of most white people, do they have the same color? 
Um, see, that's what I'm talking about. The term white, in my opinion, is very superficial. I, I don't know what that, when talking about white people, uh, they don't literally look white to me. So, you know, um, what are they really? And, uh, and also, yeah, there's a book that I have called Defining Reality, and I just want to uh, get Mr. Fuller's take on it. And it just points out that, um, you know, when someone... Can we perhaps do says, one question at a time? Hold on, sir. Can we do one question at a time? That I think would be uh, easier to get a, a good response. Uh, maybe get his, his response to your first question, and then we can deal with the second yeah. question about the book. That's fine. Okay. Groovy. Did you hear his first question, Mr. Fuller? Yes, I think if I understand the question, uh, he's talking about the classifications, but which I just went over some of them, uh, talking about the census and whatnot, uh, which I'm sure that the white Supreme, well, I'm not sure, but I will allege that the white supremacists have something to do with making the classifications. Otherwise, there would be no race problem at all if the white supremacists didn't have some input in deciding and publicizing who is white and who is not at any given time. You couldn't even have the system of white supremacy if you didn't have some type of designation of people who would be classified as white. And the white supremacists always do the designating. They are the bottom line. Other people give their opinions, but the white supremacists decide who's white and who's not. They have to. They can't give up that. They can't turn that over to someone else to decide, some non-white person to decide who's white and who's not. No, the white supremacists decide that. So, and and they prove it every day. Now, the gentleman did raise a question. I mean, he said, but he raised a question to me. And that is, who is white at any given time and who is not? And what are all of these different classifications? I didn't make these classifications. Now, I did make up a compensatory classification grouping, which I have in the book, and I always stick with it because it's the only way that I can function to make sense of what I am talking about, and that is there are just three classifications, white people, non-white people, and white supremacists, and the white supremacists are the people who are causing the problems. I charge them, you might say, or blame them because in the race problem, they are the ones who have instigated this whole thing and keep it going. Now, the white people who are not included in that group are just called white people for whatever it is. And I will know who they are simply by them saying that they are white people. And uh, they look white to me, and whether or not I will believe it or not will determine is determined by whether or not I make the decision that is this a real white person or not. The white person, the person said that he or she is white. Now the person may not look white to me, but is it a white supremacist who will definitely prove it to me as a victim of white supremacy, who is white simply by them showing up and saying, or suspected white supremacists, they will say, oh yes, I accept this person as white. And I will treat this person as a white person. And the person will sign on paperwork. They will designate on paperwork that he or she is white. And so I might tell that white person who is doing this talking, well, I don't think this person is really white. And this is how you find out who really is a white supremacist, because if that white person or a person who looks like they're white, or who says that they're white, and it seems like other people agree with them that they're white, if they point out another person to me and say, you say that this person is not white, and I'm saying to you, for I'm saying to you as a non-white person, because you are non-white to me, that this person that I'm vouching for is a white person. And you had better act like it either. You had better act like this person is white too. And I might say, yeah, but the person doesn't look like, you know, it doesn't make any difference what you say, Fuller. I'm telling you who's white. 
I'm white, and I'm saying that this person is white. And you can't overrule me. And I'll say, well, you're acting like a white supremacist. And he says, oh, are you going to charge me with white supremacy? Who are you going to prove it by? Now, this is where the rubber meets the road, boy. Now, you are telling me that I am not in authority to determine who's white and who's not? Is that what you're saying? Where do you get your authority to do that? And I might say, well, where do you get your authority? And he'll say, well, I have plenty of people who will agree with me who have power over you. How about that? And now that's when I find out who's white. That's when Neely Fuller finds out who's really white and who's not. Because it always comes down to the muscle. And it's been my experience that the white supremacists always determine who's white and who's not. To the extent that I can't even say that the person is a white supremacist and prove it. Because there's no way for a victim of white supremacy to prove that white supremacy even exists. If the white supremacist says that it doesn't exist. Why? Because I don't have the muscle. I can only proclaim that. The white supremacist on any given day can stand up and say, white supremacy, if it ever did exist, it doesn't exist now. And it would be the white supremacist who's talking. But if I tried to say, well, the only way that you can make that determination, you must be a white supremacist yourself. And they'll say, prove it. Just like that gunslinger, if you've ever seen the movie Shane. And this cowboy named Shane faced off with a gunslinger named a hired gun named Wilson. And he called Wilson a name. He called him a low-down, lying Yankee. Anybody who's seen that movie is supposed to be a classic, a typical standoff. Both of them standing there with their guns hung low. He said, I've heard about you, Wilson. I've heard that you're a low-down, lying Yankee. And Wilson gets, got his wide stance put his thumbs in his belt, a professional guns, gunslinger, and he said two words, prove it, meaning this is the moment of truth. You say I'm a low-down line Yankee, you prove it by slapping leather. If you can bring your gun out of your holster faster than me, you will have proven that I'm a low-down line Yankee. And if you can't, you're going to be dead on this floor. Bullfighters call it the moment of truth. It's the moment when the words run out. Anybody who's ever seen a fight get started have seen scenes similar to that. Whoever runs out of words first is usually the person that takes action. Whoever runs out of words first, people name calling each other in a standoff and whatnot. Whoever runs out of words first Usually, that means that there's no more to say. It's time to act. Somebody's going to be dead in a couple of minutes or less. That's the message that comes out of that. The system of white supremacy works the same way all over the world. In a standoff, non-white people do a lot of talking. But when it comes to the place where they just about run out of words, the white supremacist says, okay, you're saying this and you're saying that, and I'm tired of talking to you. Now, boy, you're going to have to prove it, or you're going to be dead on the floor. You can do that, or you can tuck your tail between your legs and walk off like a whipped dog. So far... 
the non-white people of this planet have taken that second choice. Thanks for answering my first question. The uh, male. Who, oh, okay. Did you have, did you want to ask your second question? Yeah, it'd be great. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep it short. Um, uh, you know, what if I ask another person? You know, I mean, uh, not ask, but I mean, uh, what if I tell, you know, in a conversation about racism, white supremacy? Um, what if I bring up that, you know, in my opinion, I tell the person, you know, white or non-white, that, you know, I agree. And I think that, you know, the world is dominated by a system of white supremacy. What if the person asked me, okay, you said that, now prove it. Prove it with science, uh, scientific, uh, hard scientific facts and evidence. I mean, how, how would I respond to that question? Oh, according to the code, according to what I've written, there's no way to do that. Now, black people can argue with each other about whether even uh, white Supremes exist. It's even Stephen. It's just like prisoners in the cell block arguing about whether or not they're in prison. And so they just go back and forth until somebody just gives up. See, it's a little game that black people love to play with each other. But when they face the white supremacists, that's the moment of truth. Because the white supremacists always prove I have the power, mister, and if you don't believe it, which you are pretending that you don't believe it, because I know you believe it because you see it, you know that I am the person who decides whether or not you will have a job and what you will get paid and whether or not the money that you have is either of any value or not. You know this before you even start down this road talking to me. So you go play that game over there in the ghetto with people that look like you. You all love to play little games with each other about what kind of power you have. You walk around all day, I mean, you know, talking about you are the king of your block. But I'm the king of all blocks, including your block head. That's the way the white supremacists talk. And they prove it. So everything under the system of white supremacy, you can't prove it by an argument with the white supremacists. Everything. Anybody who's ever been in a quote, unquote, serious court of law knows this. You'd better have some white supremacists on your side that will have some sympathy for you and agree with you. Otherwise, you are toast. That's the way the system works. When you say supreme, that's a word that's taken very uh, superficially by most people. Sometimes people ask me, well, am I really saying that they are supreme? Are they supreme over the entire universe? The answer is no. But they are supreme over everybody who's non-white. And that's the end of that argument because it's been proven over and over again. Now, even though I'm saying this, I can't even prove that, because I'm saying it. But the white supremacists always prove it. I've had black people tell me, well, they don't tell me what to do. I can't argue against that. I mean, I can attempt to, but I can't prove it. I can't prove it, but the white supremacists, if I watch them, where that individual who just made that statement, if I watch that individual, him or her, who says the white supremacists don't tell them what to do, if I just watch them for a little while, I don't have to watch them long. When they get around people who are white supremacists, I always learn the same lesson over again, that white supremacy does exist because I don't see them proving that it doesn't. I don't see them carrying out what they want to do against the wishes of the white supremacists. 
I've never seen any non-white person do that and survive. Haven't heard of any either. That's what white supremacy means. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the response. Thank you for uh, the question, sir. Good to hear from you. Uh, I will throw in that was one of uh, my early counter racist lessons uh, talking to white people who say, well, I don't think, you know, there's any such thing as white supremacy, all this, you know, system stuff that you're talking about. I don't think it exists. Uh, and I tried, or I made an attempt to try to prove to them that it did, and I stopped, and I thought, now, wait a minute, going back to the prison analogy, why on earth would a prisoner try to convince the warden or one of the guards that we are in a prison? Like, they know this better than I do. Like, uh, I don't even do that. I never make an effort to try to prove to white people that white supremacy exists. I feel like they know it much, much better than I do, much better than any non-white person. That's just, uh, yeah, I don't even get started on that. Um, and the fact that they could say that and get away with it proves it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 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 Yes. I mean, who, who's going to overrule them? Except a white person who's not a white supremacist. And they haven't stepped forward yet which means that they are approving of white supremacy. End of story. <laughs> means they're one of them. And proof of that is white supremacy does exist. We're still arguing about the school. So you've got some evidence that something is going on. Why is it that black people are 20 times in this area of the world? Their, their value, monetary-wise, is 20 times less as of this date. Paper said so the other day, whoever writes papers, less than a white person's. The average white person, the average black person is 20 times less in monetary value. Is that magic, or does that mean simply, which we raise this question now, of the inferiority of black people, like many white people who believe in white supremacy say that they are. Are black people inferior? Is that what that means? Is there something in black people that makes them 20 times less of value than a white person? Something in their genes, something in their very existence that makes them inferior to white people? Now, that's a subject that scares a lot of black people. When black people start talking about everybody's the same. So how do you explain it? If it's not racism... It's got to be inferiority. Take your choice. There's no wiggle room there. So a lot of black people will say, well, racism doesn't exist. Then how do you explain the condition of black people over huge periods of time? Are you saying, sir, are you saying, ma'am, that black people are inferior? Are you saying that you... If you're black, you're inferior? Is that what you're saying? Well, if this is not what you're saying, that leaves you one other option. It must be some racism working here. You don't have any other options. Take your choice. Mm. I I think I've heard you make your uh, your three-part statement where... Either the white supremacists are most to blame for all of the problems that black people face, or black people are inferior to white people, or both. And uh, yes, that that's a codified remark that I have made in many a seminar. Either the white supremacists are to blame 
for the problems of black people all underline all black people are inferior to white people all underline all both I'm going to say it again either black people either the white supremacists rather are to blame for the problems of black people or black people are inferior to white people or both. Now, why did I codify that? Well, one thing to get focus and clarity on this race issue. And then there's a constructive reason at the end, like everything in the code is supposed to be for a constructive reason. I can accept either one of those propositions or all three. Let's just say the first one, the white supremacists are to blame for the problems of black people. I believe that. Now, if I chose to believe that black people are inferior to white people, I don't choose that one, but I could because I say that let's just say that both of those statements are true. The solution is still the same. Replace white supremacy with justice. That's the solution anyway. Even if black people are inferior to white people, you still need a system where you guarantee that no person is mistreated because even an inferior person shouldn't be mistreated. Now, what do I mean by inferior? They might say that a blind person is inferior to a person who can see. But do you mistreat that person? You might say that a person born with no legs is inferior to a person who is a football star. But do you mistreat that person? What do you mean by inferior? Are you saying that they are throwaway people? I don't think the average person, even if they thought that, would go around telling the whole world that, that there is such a thing as throwaway people, people that you throw away. If that was true, you wouldn't need hospitals. A person who is lying in a hospital bed, can't move, paralyzed from the neck down, can be considered inferior to a person who is getting ready to try out for uh, a marathon, running. A person can say that. But then it comes to a question of what do you do with a person like that? You certainly don't mistreat that person. And then that other part of what you call justice, you help that person. So that's why I say, even if we are inferior, like many of the white supremacists say, even if we are inferior, so what? Justice is still the solution meaning guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. That's what we're on this planet for. So we don't even have to argue about that anymore if we take that type of logic and use it. Context. Everybody, I just want to interject this. If we took the position that a person, you know, when they say inferior means you, 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 your mind is not developed, you're not doing anything, you, you know, you, you, you know, you, you're in the way. Well, now if you take that position, you can say that about every baby that's being born right this minute. A baby that's being born right this minute can be looked at as a monumental nuisance, something in the way, something that gives you a bunch of headaches at night when it wakes up at the incorrect time. 
And some people do take that position with babies. They say, hey, we got a baby here. The baby's not going to work today. The baby's not going to bring anything in here. This baby is in the way. Kill it. A person can't take that position. But most people throughout history has taken the position, maybe that's not quite the way to look at it. A baby doesn't produce anything, so kill it. Most people throughout the history of the world have proven that they don't go along with that. Why? Because you have people here in the world, that's why. They have proven that they didn't believe that. A few people here and there, but most people have taken that, a newborn baby, worthless, not producing anything, a nuisance, in the way. So looking at it from that type of logic, you can say, kill it. Then you don't have to be bothered with it crying at night, waking you up when you got to go to work the next day. No. Exterminate it. Then you won't hear that crying. You'll wake up to a quiet house. But most people have said, maybe you shouldn't do that. That's an idea. That would be convenient. But maybe you shouldn't do that. And following that same line of thinking, they have produced things called hospitals and nursing homes, and a lot of other places. Second chance in the school. But there are a few people who do believe in the idea of getting rid of everything immediately that is of no immediate use. But down through history, that is not proven to be the best way to go about doing things. I hope I made my point. I believe you did, sir. Um, Context of white supremacy, uh, again, Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Um, When you were on the program last month, you were talking about how, um, and this is right, same vein, uh, you were were saying that uh, black people under white supremacy, that we are in a pitiful condition, but that the racists, they are aware of our potential. And that is what they are concerned about, even though right now, we are in a pitiful, uh, pitiful condition, and I just was curious um, what you meant about racists knowing black people's potential. Otherwise, they wouldn't be so vicious. You're not a, you're not, you don't, not, you're not vicious against anything that you don't consider to be a threat. That's just the way people are. All organisms are that way. All so-called neutral organisms are that way. The rocks that are on the hillside are not concerned about the trees being nearby, doing whatever trees do. Why? Because the rocks are content in what they're doing. And the trees are doing their thing, and the rocks are doing their thing in proximity to each other. But they are not hostile toward each other. Rocks are rocks, and trees are trees. And they they are their own entities. They don't consider one to be a threat to the other. Well, somebody might say, well, if you extend that kind of logic, well, what about when the water comes rushing down the hill and washes the trees away? Well, the trees take care of that, too. Trees floating down the river and whatnot are really not concerned about that, apparently. Why? Because trees get recycled one way or another. And they're put here for reasons. People are put here for reasons. And apparently, put people are put here for what reason? 
I think everybody asks that question. Why is this planet populated with people? In order to do what? Apparently, it's to solve problems in the most constructive manner. Why would that be logical? Because when people do try to solve a problem in the most constructive manner, it seems to produce a constructive result, and that might be the reason we are here. Why? Because people are here and problems are here. So if people and problems are here, evidently the only reason people are here are to solve problems, since problems are here with people, and people are given the capability of solving problems. Solving problems how? In a constructive manner? Or to expand those problems by doing things that are non-constructive? And I have a codified slogan for that, solve problems without making any. That's the key. That's the puzzle. You can solve a problem, but sometimes in the process of solving one problem, you can make three other problems. But people are supposed to use their brain power and their intentions to see to it that that doesn't happen. And as soon as you solve one problem, another problem comes up, your job is to solve that next problem that came up. And apparently that's what we are here for, by we, meaning all of the people of this planet, of this wonderful planet that we have been given, because it's all a gift. Every breath that we take is a gift. We didn't do anything to get it. You might say we certainly haven't done anything to earn it. And most of us do not use any of that time and energy that we got in the best manner. So it's a win-win situation. For one thing, we didn't make ourselves. We were created by a creator, by whatever name a person wants to call it. Some people say that there is no God, there is no beginning, there is no end and all like that. But they do believe in one thing. They believe they are here. And if they are honest, most likely because I haven't heard of any exceptions. They don't know anything about how they got here except somebody told them. So once you're here and you look around and what you're mostly looking at is one problem right after another. So what you do is say, well, since it's all a gift anyway, your arms, your legs, your fingers, your eyes, your ears, your brain, might as well just solve some of these problems with the little time that you are here. Out of all of the infinite years that have come before you and that will come after you, might as well solve some problems in the best possible manner. Why not? What else is there to do that makes sense other than solve problems in the most constructive manner and enjoy doing it rather than look at the problems and try to make them worse? like the white supremacists do. I wanted to uh, check to see. Uh, I think Justice, she said she had some other uh, questions uh, before uh, I get her. I did want to give out the address again, tiny.cc forward slash fuller in all caps, tiny.cc uh, forward slash fuller in all caps. Uh, Justice, if you have some more questions for Mr. Fuller, your line should be open. Um, if racism, white supremacy wasn't here, how do you think you would function in general? Okay, could you hold that question just for about a couple of minutes? Could you? Uh, y- yes. Hello? Yes. yes. Hello? Yes? Mm-hmm. We'll be back uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, she'll be making her 11th visit uh, just a couple hours away. Dr. Welsing, a whole day of hopefully constructive 
counter racist programming. Uh, looking forward to having her back on the program. Um, and again, Mr. Fuller, if you need the word guide or the code book, tiny.cc forward slash Fuller in all caps. Uh, we have about nine minutes uh, left in the program. Uh, it will be a quick break, and then we'll be back 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Hope, uh, hope people, hopefully, the non-white listeners are finding the uh, broadcast constructive. Um, also, see if we have time for a news report. Do you have a news report today, Justice? Uh, yes. Okay, we'll do that once. Uh, we finish up with Mr. Fuller. We'll do our news report and uh, wrap this broadcast up, and then we will be back. 7 p.m., Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Um, we'll also uh, make sure I get in uh, one, Invention of Lying. Mentioned that yesterday. Very interesting film. Two, uh, Counter Racist Evolving Engineer. Cree, thank you again. Yes, I'd like to apologize to the audience there for uh, that delay. I'm going to have to terminate this uh, interview, maybe in about another seven minutes. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, right, and sorry about that, uh, but continue. What was the question? Hello? The question The question is, uh, if racism, white supremacy wasn't here, how do you think you would function in general? Uh, if racism, I didn't quite get the question. I'm, I'm having race- problems. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hang on. Uh, let's see. I'll turn my uh, microphone up just a little bit. Okay. Can I be heard better now? Okay. Uh, if racism, white supremacy wasn't here, how do you think you would function in general? Oh, I don't know. I simply don't know because everything that I've ever done was a reaction to the existence of racism. Uh, The concept is if you're in a prison and the system of racism is a prison, you conform to the prison. If you're a, a fish in the ocean, you conform to being in the ocean. The fish knows nothing outside of the ocean as long as the fish is in the ocean and has never been outside the ocean. So it's the same way with a person in the system of racism. When you're in the system of racism, you're born into the system of racism. The only thing you know is to react to the system of racism because that's the only environment you have ever been in. And so I don't know how I would act if I were not in the system of racism. If I was born on the planet Krypton, and on a different environment, different problems, if any, then I would be, my behavior would be completely different. I'm reasonably certain, logically speaking, from what it is now. I certainly wouldn't be talking about racism in a system where there was none, or there was no talk about any, or I didn't uh, perceive that there ever had been. If I was born in a world in which there had never been any racism, never been any talk about racism, people didn't know what racism is or was, and there was no word for it, I wouldn't even be having this discussion now. But I discovered in the world that I'm in that racism dominates everything that I do, just like a prison, prisoner rather, of war, and this is a war, a prisoner of war will act the way that a prisoner of war acts in a prison that's designed for prisoners of war. And if the prisoner of war has never been in any other environment, that's all that that prisoner will know. If the prisoner was born in that prisoner of war camp. You might hear about other things and have a little bit of influence, but most of your daily activities, all of your daily activities, rather, will be dictated by whomever 
is running the prison. Now, I hope that answers that satisfactorily. How do non-white people get confused about racism, white supremacy? Well, non-white people get confused about racism, white supremacy, because the white supremacists could not function if non-white people, if their victims, were not confused. This is why information is power. The more people understand what white supremacy is and how it works, the less confused people will become and the system of white supremacy will be in big trouble because you cannot dominate people unjustly over a long period of time without keeping the people who are being dominated confused. It doesn't work because the people will become smarter about what they're dealing with once they have focus on what they're dealing with. The whole idea is become focused that there is a system of racism in place and that nothing will ever make sense about what people should be doing until that system is done away with. Then people will have a tendency to focus on the one thing that's the biggest stumbling block to things being the way that they should be as opposed to them continuing the way that they are now, which is the way that they shouldn't be. Meaning what? We're in a system of non-justice where there is a concept, at least, of a system of justice. At least people have that concept. It's never been done. But just because something has never been done doesn't say that it can't be done. Justice has never been produced, at least on this planet, as far back as recorded history is concerned. There's never been a situation on this planet, as far back as anybody can remember or anybody will claim with any credibility, where no one was being mistreated and that all of the people that needed help the most were getting that help because this planet can provide all of that for everybody if people do the things that need to be done. The white supremacists could very easily, by not being white supremacists, the white people who practice white supremacy, have enough intelligence to bring this about. They could just abolish the system of white supremacy and replace it with a system of justice in a very short period of time. But, unfortunately, they have chosen to be comfortable with a system of racism. And, according to the evidence, decided that they're not giving it up anytime soon. And if uh, the record shows that. But they have a concept of justice. If they didn't have a concept of justice or a word for it, I wouldn't be using the word. They gave me the concept. And I guess my instincts would tell me that anyway over a period of time when things are out of balance. All organisms can tell that. Even a cat can sense when things are out of balance. But there's a word for it. It's called justice. But that word has never had a definition that made sense. I came up with a compensatory definition, and that is guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. And until a better definition is thought of, I accept that definition, the one that I came up with, because the only reason I thought of that definition is because I was dissatisfied with the definitions that I had heard because they were confusing. And some were no definitions at all. But I think that's pretty specific when you say guaranteeing that no person is mistreated. 
and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. Now, we have had some illustrations of this, at least as a guideline. Let's just say in a hospital, since this is what they call 9-11, let's just say that is an example. And we are in the same situation, or we have the same situation going on that went on 10 years ago. And let's say this is a hospital. This is a hospital situation as an illustration. People start coming into the hospital. The first person in has is holding his or her head and says they bump their head, falling down some steps, trying to get away from the explosions. And then another person comes in, and that person has her arm dangling, almost about to come off. So there's a case right there. Helping the person that needs help the most. You go to person number two, the person with the dangling arm. That's the person that needs help the most in an obvious situation. Most situations are pretty obvious that way, worldwide, at any given moment. And that doesn't say that you don't help the person who had the head bump. It just says that that person would be the second person to help, not the first. The person with the dangling arm would be the first person to help. Then you move to the second person. You treat both people. You see to it that everybody is treated. But you go to the person that needs help the most. And that's in any situation, a financial situation, a homeless situation, so-called houseless situation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in all of the areas of activity. Very simple formula. And in the process, you don't mistreat anyone. You got to do both. You got to do both simultaneously. Don't mistreat anyone. And at the same time, give everybody the help that they need. Constructive help. Not non-constructive help, constructive help. That's the formula. I think there won't be anytime soon any better definition for the word justice. That's a compensatory definition. One that I had to make up because the other definitions didn't make sense. When somebody else thinks of a better one, everybody should get aboard and think of that one. I can't think of one better than that right now. Does that answer the question? Because I am going to have to leave at this point. Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming on the program. Um, I think uh, that we would uh, 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 we would be glad to um, have you back on um, for the 16th uh, visit on the COWS uh, Context of White Supremacy. And, um, yeah, I am uh, happy that uh, you came on to share constructive, uh, well, I hope, a constructive um, information to uh, work against the system of racism and white supremacy and to inform more non-white people uh, about racism and white supremacy. And thank you for inviting me. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Fuller. Context of white supremacy. Uh, again, Dr. Welsing, uh, she will be following Mr. Fuller. Uh, she will be here in 55 minutes. Uh, Dr. Welsing making her 11th visit uh, to Mark, September 11th, 2011. Again, the greatest terrorists in the known universe. Racist man racist woman. Uh, Justice, if you have uh, a news report that you would like to share, feel free. Yes, I do. Uh, this article is from racismdaily.com. Um, it was 
posted on September 9th, so let me see, that was, I believe, two days ago, um, of this year, 2011, uh, still racism, white supremacy is still, uh, existing, um, uh, the title is Pennsylvania, man gets 18 months for cross-burning. Testimony by a biracial friend, uh, a person that has a white parent, uh, wasn't enough to keep an Indiana County man from being sentenced to prison for participating in a cross burning. Kenneth P. Stiffy, uh, Jr., 21, of Robert of Robertson, pleaded guilty to a federal conspiracy charge in March, along with two other men and a juvenile. Uh, he cons- he cons- he conspired to burn a six foot cross on November 14th in the yard of the white foster parents of a black teenager. U.S. District Judge Alan Blotch sentenced him today to one year and six months in prison and three years of prohibition. Nicholas Clark, 22, uh, testified that Siffy and his family have fully accepted him uh, despite his being part black and homosexual. He said Stiffy's uh, participate. Uh, he says Stiffy's participation in the cross burning seems weird, based on his own interactions with Stiffy. Uh, it was a dis. It was a dis. Das- it was a uh, distasteful prank that got out of hand. Clerk said, "I don't think he's a racist person." Stiffy apologized. Stiffy apologized to the victims who were her who weren't present in the courtroom and said he regretted his act. I'm ashamed of myself for ta- for having taken any part at all, he said. Stiffy's parents declined comments after the hearing. Thomas Farrell, Stiffy's lo- lawyer, said the fact that Stiffy was friends with Clark as well as the black teenager taken in by the white foster parents. Uh, why foster parents, meaning they removed uh, the black uh, the black teenager from uh, his uh, original parents. Uh, uh, white foster let me see um, taken in by the white foster parents doesn't uh, negate his act of bigotry, but does show he was. Uh, uh, my computer. Wow. Are you still there, Justice? Oh, she went offline. Hmm. Could be interference from racist man and racist woman. Um, I will look to see, uh, if we can uh, get her back online. Um, hmm. Again, interference from racists. I can say while I was listening, that report had quite a few of the things Mr. Fully talked about. You got some gutter sex, anti-sexual behavior. Uh, gutter sex, anti-sexual behavior. The confusing terms. Biracial. Mr. Fuller was talking about half white, part white, all of that together, biracial, not using the most accurate terms uh, to describe racial classifications, um, lots of conf- – and the cross-burning, the religion of white supremacy. Um, yeah, computer difficulties, uh, you know, the people who are most to blame, Mr. Fuller, racist woman, racist man, uh, Justice's blog – just do justice today dot blogspot dot com again just do justice today dot blogspot dot com you can follow up with that report on racism daily dot com uh, we will be back in forty nine minutes dr francis cress welsing making her eleventh visit to the context of white supremacy we will be talking about the uh Norway terrorism incident, she had an opportunity, Dr. Welsing, to look through some of his 
diary and uh, see how it relates to her theory of white genetic annihilation. Uh, always constructed to have Dr. Welsing on the program. Hope you all will be able to tune in live, call in if you have uh, questions, all that good stuff. We'll be back now uh, 48 minutes. Uh, hopefully the program was constructive. Uh, invest uh, if you think the cows is productive towards replacing white supremacy with justice. And uh, remember, share the links. Very helpful uh, if you think non-white people would benefit from hearing the program. Uh, we will be right back. Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, today, Sunday, September 11th, 2011. Context of white supremacy. Signing out. Thank you for tuning in.